Are you a fan of horror movies? Necronomicon Ex Mortis. The Book of the Dead. We're all cult classics. Your move, creep. If you are, you'll love shocking things. Please search for us on all the major podcasting platforms. To see our social media and a direct link to our podcast, please go to anchor.fm slash shocking things. Tracy Smothers, Harley Race, Tim Storm, Bushwhacker Luke, Bobby Fool, The Pro, Pro Wrestling, Wrestling Vault, Vault Volume, Volume 1, 1. Bill Dundee, Super Mix Hernandez, C.W. Anderson, Ricky Morton, Sir Mo, and many others share their stories of determination, triumph, and, and sorrow. sorrow. Get your book today at Russellville.com or at Amazon.com. Russellville, it's a wrestling bit. And welcome, everybody, to the PWZ Podcast. This is the Professor Rick Del Santo, and joining me today is a very special guest, someone I've been looking forward to talking to for a very long time, Aaron Camaro. How are you, my friend? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on the show, man. It's pretty exciting. You know, I do the Decibel Geek Podcast, so we're always talking about rock and roll, but my other true love is professional wrestling. So anytime I get a chance to shoot the breeze about pro wrestling, I'm in. Let's do it. (laughs) Let's talk a little bit about this decibel geek for a minute because I listened to a couple episodes uh recently and you're a huge rock and roll fan. I work in a record store part-time. I've worked there for almost 30 years. Nice. So um what kind of stuff do you talk? You cover mostly hard rock, metal, stuff like that, 80s stuff like right. that. Yeah, so, pretty much yeah. anything from the Beatles and the Stones to Zeppelin and Sabbath to Kiss and Aerosmith to Crew and you know Motley Crew and uh and Guns N' Roses and Metallica and all the way up to today. You know, there's a there's a ton of great bands out there that have the spirit of the classic rock bands that we all grew up on and love. And, you know, these bands aren't going to be around forever. Yeah. You hear guys like Paul Stanley, man, they're kind of croaking out there, but they're like 70 years old. You know, the videos came up of Bon Jovi last week sounding terrible, but the crowd, the people are still out there going nuts for it. What happens when they're really, truly 100% done, you know? So we also try to showcase up-and-coming bands that have the same spirit as the stuff we grew up on and love. That's awesome. I've heard a couple songs that you played, and I was really interested. One band that I do have to mention that Kicking has never really stopped that I absolutely love, Cheap Trick. You know, those guys are just non-stop they just play all the time and that's like one of my favorite bands i saw them prior to the, to the pandemic rick nielsen was actually sick and they had the roadie fill in wow. you remember this it was like at a mohegan sun casino and then uh shortly after the guy got sick and passed away which was just uh real bizarre no wow. yeah man that's my man love cheap this, trick they're like one of my favorites it was really sad to hear about this you know rick was sick and yeah Anyways, um, we're here to talk about professional wrestling. We can talk music as well. And um, that's it. So tell me how, when and how you got interested in professional wrestling. Oh, man. When I was a little kid, man, I was wrestling crazy. Like, my parents probably thought, there's something wrong with this kid. Like, they tell me <laughs> I would sit with my grandpa and my great uncle when I was a little tiny kid. And they would hoot and holler and yell at the TV when AWA was on and I would just laugh and laugh and laugh, you know, and have such a good time hanging out with them. My first real memory of like sitting down and seeing professional wrestling and just being like, what is this is watching AWA over at my uncle Roger's house. And it was the Milwaukee crusher against Baron Von Raschke, the old claw master and being from Wisconsin you know, everybody loved the crusher. You know, he, he was the guy. He, he was at a big beer belly, but he was a fist fighter. You know, and his his thing was he'd run up and down the, the uh, Lake Michigan with a barrel of beer on his back, right. smoking a cigar. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to dance with the polka girls all night long. And that's how I train for my matches. You know, and I remember seeing that. And she'd be like, what? You know, what is this? Because I liked football. And mm-hmm. I like Kiss, the band, and you know, rock music. And I like yeah. comic books when I was little. 
and pro wrestling like kind of combined all those things the athleticism the characters the you know the action the excitement and it was over the top and i loved it loved pro wrestling my dad on the other hand man he would never miss an opportunity to tell me i can't believe you like that shit you know that shit's fake you know <laughs> And he'd say that to me all the time. And I'd be like, but I like it, but I like it. And finally, one time he said to me, you know, and he said stuff like this all the time. He says to me, you know, if I back the honky tonk man up into the corner and I climb up on the rope and I punch him in the face 10, match over. And I'm like, when he said that, I kind of <laughs> thought about it, you know, and I was like, okay, so there is something about, you know, there's something to what he's saying here. But then it only made me that much more interested because then it's like, okay, if that's what this is, how does it work? You know, and who decides? And, you know, and then I became like even more delved in on it because I wanted to figure out the mystery of pro wrestling because no matter what anybody said about it, I loved it. You know, loved it. Yeah. Read all the magazines, couldn't miss a show. What year was that about that you discovered it? Oh, if you man, know, because you're young. mentioning the the AWA, they had a really big peak in this, you know, in the 70s and 80s. I'm trying to think because yeah. because of some of the would, names you mentioned. I would say around 82, yeah, okay, 83 around in there. I was pretty young, yeah. maybe not quite 10 yet, you know, and saw it yeah. was like what, you know. And then we watched WWF on TV. Um, never got to go to an AWA show when I was young, but WWF back then mm -hmm. would come to Wausau, Wisconsin, which is okay. a smaller town, and do like B level house shows. And so every once in a great while, we get to like go to DC Everest High School and WWF be putting on a show there, and it'd be like Akeem and guys like that, Jim the Anvil, <laughs> Neidhart, and you know, guys that you know, they, Hulk Hogan wasn't there, and Ultimate Warrior yep. wasn't there. And, you know, but you'd still get to see wrestling. But where I grew up, it wasn't like, I mean, I live in Nashville now, you know, and this is, there. this place is wrestling historic. Up in the Absolutely. little town I grew up in, you know, wrestling wasn't that revered, you know, and everybody kind of thought I was weird for liking it, but I couldn't help myself. I love the shit. I think I discovered it around 1984. I think there was a very small period where I didn't watch. But now here at almost 47 years old, I think I watch it more than I ever did as a kid. Because it's there's more. There's so much more to watch now. <laughs> right. Growing up when I was a kid, <clears throat> excuse me, it was WWF, you know, Saturday and Sunday mornings, Monday nights with prime time. I'd get home after school. World class was on TV. AWA was on ESPN. Uh, there was so much more. I used to get Memphis TV up here for a brief period as well. Nice. So, uh, you know, there was so much wrestling on in the 80s but now today if you look at it now there's wrestling on every single night of the week yeah definitely. sometimes there's multiple shows a night you know yeah. two three hours uh for one show and then another two hours it's incredible what's going on these days it's a great time to be a pro wrestling fan because i remember being yeah. a kid and i'd see awa and mm -hmm. then i see wwf and be like okay so this is the same but it's different Mm -hmm. And then, like, years later, I remember staying over at, like, friends of my parents' house, and they had cable TV, and I saw WCW Saturday Night, and I was like, oh, you know, so there's more, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I'd get, like, the Pro Wrestling Illustrated magazines, and I had a friend that would get weird, like, almost bootleg wrestling magazines that had, like, the advertisements for the girl wrestling in a bikini yeah. advertisements in the back, and, and then... uh and then, like, from there, I remember my parents had a satellite dish eventually, like, in the 90s. And I was catching a channel one time called MSG, and I saw ECW. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit. Like, the first thing I ever seen was those guys taking Tommy Dreamer and throwing him off the balcony through the pyramid of tables. And I was like, what? And so, like, I was a little rock and roll party kid in high school, but like it'd be Saturday night and this was before like DVR and it was so easy and you'd have to have a video yep. set. You'd have to hope you had it set up right. I would leave parties at like nine o'clock <laughs> on a Saturday night. My friends would be like, where are you going, man? We got beer. We got weed. We got girls. You know, like, hey, man, I got to go. You know, and they'd be like, well, where are you going? And I wouldn't want to tell them, you know, I'm going home to watch. <laughs> but 
how crazy I was about it. And then, and then the Monday night wars, man, that's, that's what really, really locked me into love and pro wrestling was like when, when Hogan turned heel was such a holy shit moment because it was like, you never thought that guy would turn against the fans. And it was so intriguing at the time. It was like, I was hooked. So mm-hmm. I had a job and I'd make sure I had Monday nights off. So I'm in my, <laughs> you know, I'm in my twenties now. Right. And I'd have Monday night off and I'd go up to the bar around the corner from my apartment and I'd go in and I'd throw down a 20. I'd say, give me a beer, give me a shot, give me the remote and you can keep the change. And they go, okay. And they give me the remote <laughs> and I turn it to WCW Nitro and I sit in the bar and drink beer and, uh, and then, and watch wrestling. And then once Nitro was over, I'd flip over to raw for that last part, but you could flip back and forth on the commercials and stuff. So eventually people started coming in and be like, Oh, you're watching nitro. Like, can I sit with you and watch? I'd be like, sure. You know, have a seat. So then it turned into more and more people, more and more people. So every Monday night we're having like nitro parties at this bar where we're doing shots every time Hogan says brother. And, (laughs) you know, I was like, man, this is amazing. You know, there's other people here that love pro wrestling. It's funny because a lot of people do look down upon it, but now it's like during the hot streaks, like you said, the Monday Night Wars. Not there wasn't a lot of those people that were looking down on it. A lot of those people were, you know, would admit that they tuned in on Mondays, whether it be Raw, whether it be uh, Nitro, or what have you. Mm-hmm. I remember here you mentioned ECW and MSG. I was working my uh, first job at the time. I was a teenager. And we got MSG as regular channel over here, and um, <clears throat> it was on two o'clock in the morning, you know, yeah. Saturday into Sunday. So I used to just rush home and I'd stay up all night and watch it, <laughs> you know. And it was such a fun thing because it was, it was different. It wasn't like you're watching the AWA five years earlier, or six years earlier. You know what I mean? It wasn't. Right. It just wasn't your grandparents wrestling or your parents no, wrestling that they grew awesome. up on. There was blood, barbed wire, tables, all the sorts of stuff happening that i didn't watch you know on saturday mornings growing up it was just something different about it and the with the promos and the way they talk and the language they'd use and yep. the the women involved and how you know like i mean wwe got sable and sunny the ecw got all these women and they're being extra sexy you know this was yes. like pg-13 rated wrestling you know maybe sometimes right. even lingering in the it was a little, a little bit, bit. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. definitely. I think uh, <clears throat> trying to remember her name was it Angel? Was that her name? Uh, Francine? No, I remember her. I'm trying yeah. to. There was another one that definitely did uh, some sort of video, you know. Oh <laughs> so, yeah, 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 inappropriate yeah. video. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, man, it was um, it was just a, that was a great time. But it goes in waves as well. You know, it'll be immensely popular, then die down for a number of years, and then kick it up. You know, and right. then uh, like right now. Between streaming services, cable TV, seven days a week, there's professional wrestling. And you don't even have to, well, not that you would, but leave your house on a Saturday if you want to watch professional wrestling. All right. It's true. It's true. But yeah. the other cool part about that is people still go out and catch live shows. You know? Yeah. And That's all I still do. Yeah. It, it had been a minute since I'd done a live show, but I started working a little bit with these guys called CHW. And they run in a city here, a town here called Ashland City in Tennessee. Okay. And uh, I've been doing some shows with them, doing some ring announcing and having some fun and interviewing and doing stuff like that. And uh, it's cool to see people coming out. Like, they ran a show the same night as WrestleMania. And I don't know if they thought about it when they set it up. But that night I was like, geez, you know, aren't you a little worried running up against WrestleMania where people can just stay home and watch it? No, that place was packed. They packed the place out, really? and it was a good show, and a lot of fun. I was surprised. If I, if I had the opportunity to go to a live show over watching, you know, something on television, I would absolutely be there. There's always a record button or the on-demand feature, you know what right. I mean? Uh, yeah. Especially if it's a local indie show. I, I love supporting my local, you know, local indies. And that's what this podcast is mostly about. You know, we have guys on here several times a week uh, from our area. Tell me about how you got involved in the world of professional wrestling. Well, I guess the first thing was in the town I grew up in, there was these young guys about my age that had gotten a hold of a ring and they were doing some stuff. And so I got hung out with them a little bit, but really didn't get involved in it. 
because I was working at the radio station at the time. I got my foot in the door on radio. And so, uh, you know, I would I would give them free advertisement a lot of times. We're like, hey, you know, the wrestling is going to be set up in the parking lot of the of the Champs restaurant and come down and see it. It's free. You know, and we just try to get they try to get people to come out and see it. Right. And uh, and from there, in about 2002, many years, many years after that, um, my brother is living down here in Nashville. <clears throat> And I come down to visit and he's like, you got to come with me down to the fairgrounds on Wednesday night. And I said, Oh, what is, what is it? He's like, it's TNA wrestling. They've been doing these shows down at the fairgrounds. You never know who's going to show up. He'd be like, you know, Dusty Rhodes was there a week ago. And then the road warriors showed up and Ken Shamrock's there. And I go, Oh yeah, yeah, let's go. Let's go. And so I went to that first show and I was just like, wow you know what it was like to be in a like the fairgrounds was a historic place you know that place was built for professional wrestling it's gone now they just recently tore it down but uh to go in there and have a place just so full of people like there'd be Mm -hmm. sometimes you know i guess the the max was about five thousand. some nights i could see you know creeping up on four in that place on TNA nights and sometimes probably right up to the maximum because the place would be jam packed, you know, depending on who was there. And I saw that and was like, this is amazing. I want to move to Nashville. If I can do this every Wednesday night, if I can go to a wrestling show, that's this good and this fun, I'm going to move to Nashville. So then I did, I moved to Nashville, started going to the TNA shows down at the fairgrounds at the, on the regular all the time at the asylum. And, uh, It was awesome, you know, and I'd see Jeremy Borash and I go, you know, I feel like I could do that. You know, I feel like I could do that because Borash was a good ring announcer, but he was an even better kind of a live event host when you go to these live shows because he's not just ring announcing. He's sort of reacting to the stuff that's happening in front of him and he's involving the fans in the action by talking to them and stuff. And I always thought that was pretty cool. And I thought, you know, I'd sure like to do this, you know. And so then once I moved down here, I realized, man, you know, that as big as TNA is kind of a thing around here and all these people go to it, there's all these other little shows on the outskirts all over the place. And sometimes these TNA guys will be at them. So I started going with my wife and uh, my kid and we'd go to the wrestling shows all the time. And uh, I thought, man, you know, and I'd listen to some of the ring announcers at the lower level shows. And I'm like, oh, man, I could do I know I could do so much better, you know, if I only had the opportunity. So one day I'm, I'm on the Craigslist and I don't even remember how, but I found which Craigslist incidentally is the same way I found Decibel Geek. But I found an advertisement for a wrestling promotion in a town called Millersville and they're looking for people, but it doesn't exactly say what they're looking for. So I answer it and I go, Hey, you know, what are you looking for? They're like, well, come down. So it's the following Friday. This coming Saturday is a show down at the fairgrounds that I think it was Burt Prentice was running it. Yep. He ran there every Saturday for all the time. time. Yeah. Burt yep. Prentice used to run the fairgrounds, uh, yeah. U.S. championship wrestling. The main yeah. event of this show is Jerry Lawler versus Sid Vicious. And in Sid Vicious's corner is Jimmy Hart. So I know I got this thing coming up next Friday, but I'm at the show with my wife and kid and it's intermission. We're kind of sitting pretty close to where Jimmy Hart's over there signing stuff. So the lights go back down and everybody leaves Jimmy Hart. They go back to their seats. When everybody else leaves, I slide over there to Jimmy Hart. I say, Hey Jimmy, my name's Aaron. I'm a big fan. I've been a big fan of yours for a long time, man. I just want to thank you for being so awesome for so many years. And Jimmy Hart's just the sweetest heart guy. You know, you're like, oh, you know, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. you know, that's really nice of you to say. And I say, oh, hey, Jimmy, you know, and I know what I'm doing. And I go, hey, Jimmy, you know, I'm from Wisconsin. And my friends all say I got a big mouth. If I ever had the chance to become a part of, pro, have a part in pro wrestling, do you think I could call myself the mouth of the North? And again, Jimmy Hart's such a sweet, nice guy. He goes, yeah, sure, baby. God bless. And I know in, in his mind, I know he's thinking, are you going to buy something? Get the hell out of here, you dumb mark. You know? <laughs> but I'm, I'm okay with that because I know that's what he's thinking, but he still said God bless. And, you know, God bless him for saying it and being such a nice guy. Next Friday night, I show up at this building. 
I've never been in this town before. It's not too far from where I'm at, but I cruise out there. I go in, I'm looking around, I'm going, okay, this is pretty cool. Come around the corner and there's a ring and chairs all set up. I'm like, oh, hell yeah, you know? So then I'm kind of standing around, standing around. Eventually somebody comes out and I say, hey, my name's Aaron. I'm answering the ad, you know, want to find out what you guys need. So I sit down with four guys. It's TJ Weatherby, who's the owner that runs uh, it was Southern All-Star Wrestling. It was okay. kind of a unique setup out there. So they run shows every Friday night. But one Friday night would be a TV taping because they were taping TV shows. I think they had something local here. So I sit down with TJ Weatherby. I sit down with Paul Adams, who was just a super he smart ran. guy. He, they, he used to come up here for Northeast Wrestling for a while. As a manager? Paul Adams. Yeah, and he passed yeah, away yeah. a few years back. Yeah. Uh, and then I think he took part in the Heroes of Wrestling pay per view, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, right on. That. Yeah, yep. that guy, he was smart. Yep. You know, he could run a show, he could tell stories. You know, great booker, great writer. Yep. And but when he was a heel manager, yep. oh, that guy could get heat, he was man. Good. Yeah. Oh, they people hated his guts. So it's TJ, it's Paul, it's Reno Riggins who if you're a professional wrestling fan, you remember, yeah. especially back in the eighties, you remember Reno Riggins. He as, was a great wrestler. Yeah. Back they, in the day. Well, but in the WWF, he was kind of yeah. like an enhancement talent. Yes, you know, he, he, was. Would, he yeah. would put over on Saturday morning shows. Like when I was little, I always would be mad because the Saturday morning shows was always a somebody versus a nobody. And you always knew who was going to win. <laughs> but Reno Riggins was one of those guys that would always help make, you know, make the stars, you know, somebody has got to lose. Right. If yeah. everybody won all the time, what fun would it be? How could that work? Somebody's got to lose. So if you're going to have somebody that's in that role, they t- accept it for what it is. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, he traveled the world, I'm sure, you know, and is one of the, is still well known in the business, you know? So, and, and there's another guy there named Krull and Krull was a super popular, well-known wrestler here in the Tennessee area. And I mean, these four guys were all pretty smart when it comes to professional wrestling. So I sit down and talk to them and I, they say, well, what can you do? And I said, well, you know, I got a radio background. I can do interviews. I can ring announce. I can call the matches. You know, I'm just rattling off anything. I said, I mean, I'll do anything. I just, you know, I, I'm not going to jump off the top rope. I don't want nobody hitting me with a chair. You know, I don't want nobody jumping off top rope onto me. But other than that, you know, you tell me what you need. And so it went back and forth. Well, what can you do? What do you need? can you do what do you need you know and so then finally i can see they're just kind of looking at each other and i go well let me tell you this you know uh i was talking to jimmy hart just last weekend when he was in town and you know he told me that if i wanted to i could you know i could go by the mouth of the north and then they all look at me like really (laughs) and i was like yeah and they're like okay cool you know that's pretty cool so then they go okay we'll hang out for a minute we'll let you know i said okay so i'm standing around standing around Stand around, stand around, don't see nobody. They all go backstage. I mean, they're in the ring area, and I'm watching a couple of guys work out. I'm like, man, this is pretty cool, you know? So then the wrestlers go, and there's another dude standing in there. So I go, go to him. I go, hey, what are you doing here? And he says, while I'm here, I want to be a cameraman. I said, cool, man, what'd they tell you? And he said, they told me just to hang out for a minute, and they'd let me know. But that was like, you know, 40-some minutes ago. And I go, yeah, yeah, me too, me too, you know. So I'm waiting around. Now it's creeping up on an hour, a little over an hour. I go outside, and I call the wife, and I said, you know, I think I'm just going to come home. You know, these guys, they just kind of left me out here. I go, you know, no, no, I'm going to go back in one more time. I'm going to go back in one more time and see. I got to, I came this far, you know, I got to follow it through. Let me go back in. So I go back in, and dude's still sitting in there, and I stand around for a little bit longer. But now all of a sudden, people are starting to come in and take the seats. And I go, what is going on here, you know? And I go, oh, shit. There's a show here tonight. So now I'm like, dang, there's a show here tonight. I didn't even even know it, you know? So now I'm looking, looking. Where is somebody? Where is somebody? I see Krull. He's walking up the ramp to the backstage. I run over to him. I go, hey, hey, hey. Is a show here tonight? And he says, yeah. I said, anything I can do to help? He goes, Want a ring announce? And my heart goes, yes. My brain goes, wait a minute. But I say, yeah, you bet. You know, he goes, come on. You know, so I go backstage and I'm thinking about it. I go, okay, this is great. You know, I just volunteered myself, 
but I've never done it before. How hard can it be? I think about Finkel. You know, how does Finkel do it? On his way to the ring, weighing in at these many pounds, hailing from this town, it's this guy, you know, and just repeat. So I go backstage and I tell him, you know, hey, I need a pen and a paper. They look at me like, pen and paper, what's that for? I said, so I got a knife so I know what to say. They go, oh, you're going to do all that. And I was like, well, I mean, that's the way it's done, right? And they're like, well, yeah, sure. Here, here you go, pen and paper. So I started making my way around the locker room, shaking hands. Hey, my name's Aaron. I'm going to be ringing out since tonight. What's your name? Where are you from? Got any kind of cool nickname? What about you, Way? Write it down. Okay, awesome. Make my way to the board later on. Put the pieces together with everybody I introduced to. Anybody on the board that I didn't find, I go find them, get the information, go out, ring announce the show. Halfway through the show, Reno Riggins looks over at me. He's just like, <laughs> I was like, okay, cool, cool, you know. So I'm not dressed for it. I didn't think nothing of it. You know, I didn't know I was going to be doing it that night. I just kind of threw into it. After the show, they come to me and they got a white envelope. And I go, well, what's this? And they go, well, that's your pay. Do you, can you come back next week? And I was like, yeah, you know. Yeah, it was awesome. like at that time, I mean, I wasn't expecting to get paid for it. I was having so much fun and kind of living a dream a little bit, you know, getting to do something that I've always wanted to do. Uh, yeah, you damn right I'll be back next week. So it just went from there. I started out as the ring announcer. And then I became Aaron Camaro. And then I started wearing the bandana and the long hair. And I'd get, you know, bright, flashy jackets. My wife would help me make them. And I became the rock and roll ring announcer. And so I would, took a little bit of Paul Stanley, David Lee Roth, D. Snyder, and mixed it with Dave Penzer and, you know, Howard Finkel and guys like that and figured out a way to combine them and then have fun with it. And so I would tell jokes. I'd crack people up. I'd just have a good time with it and just be good, you know, and be loud and really boisterous and use my voice to, you know, really make it seem like this is the most important thing that you could possibly be seeing right now. And it worked out pretty good for me. It worked out really good for a while. And uh, it came to a point where, they came to me, and anybody that's ever been involved in professional wrestling will know this, this, this is the phrase you never want to hear because shit's about to go south. Dude comes to me and goes, hey, Camaro, because you're doing an awesome job ringing out. I said, thank you. He goes, you know, we're doing this TV show, but we're taking this thing to the next level. Now, over the years, when somebody comes to me and says, we're taking this thing to the next level, I go, shit. That's that's the red flag that always comes up. This was the first time we're taking it to the next level. I go, okay. I don't know what that means. You know, okay. He goes, are you with us? And I said, oh, yeah, you bet I'm with you. You know, next level, let's do it. I'm thinking, you know, real TV. And he goes, okay, great. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to find you a black suit jacket, a black pair of pants, white button-up shirt, black tie. Lose the beard shave that shit off, cut your hair, um, and come back next week and be a real ring announcer. I was like, what? <laughs> no, no. You know, I was like, okay. And I went home and man, I sweated it and I sweated it and I sweated it for three days. And I thought, you know, this is so awesome. And I love doing this and I love watching you know finally all them years trying to figure out how it works and to be right there to see exactly how it works was just so awesome to me i didn't want to give it up i didn't want to stop doing it i love wrestling for so long and now here i am in it and i'm going to lose my opportunity because i don't want to change the way i look but on the other hand people really seem to love me this way and i've seen the straight lace ring announcers they're good but they're no fun you know and i'm fun and this is you know, and I don't want to do it. And I battled it and I battled it. And I finally fired him off an email a couple of days later and said, you know, if I'm not the kind of ring announcer you're looking for, go find them, you know, but I'm not doing it. I'm happy with what I got going on. The people really like it and I'm going to keep doing it. 
So what ends up happening is I don't go to the show the next Friday night. I just don't show up. And it's a TV taping. Well, I ain't got a ring announcer. That's pretty bold. So I didn't get no, <laughs> no response to the email. I just didn't show right. then at that point because I told wow. them, you know, okay, go find what you're looking for. If I ain't it, that's fine. Right. So TJ Weatherby calls me up and he goes, hey, you know, TJ is outside of the whole TV taping. He just runs the promotion and the building and he runs on the off Friday nights when it's more local young guys, up and comers, no big names on his shows. Right. He goes, where were you Friday night? And I told him what happened. And he goes, well, I mean, that ain't got nothing to do with me. Would you want to still come out and do, you know, the other Friday nights? And I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. So eventually Mr. Take it to the next level comes back on an opposite Friday night and says, where, where have you been? And I said, well, I sent you the email. You wanted me to change everything about myself and I didn't want to do it. So, you know, that's, that was the end of that. And he goes, but why are you here? You know, why are you, so why are you here? And I said, well, I'm ring announcing tonight. And he goes, but, and he was so confused. He's like, but this is the lame show. He goes, this is the, the local guys. This isn't the TV taping. And I said, that may be true. I said, but, uh, TJ and his, his opposite Friday nights here, TV tapings, they like me just the way I am. And I'm happy to do these shows because I'd still rather be a part of it than, you know, do what you're asking me to do. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, no, uh, so-and-so told me to say that. And so I'd go to so-and-so and then so-and-so would be like, no, no, they told me. And this guy, oh, Jerry Jarrett was the one that said that. I talked to Jerry Jarrett years later. He's like, no, man, I love you the way you are. I said, okay, cool. I always wondered about that. But then... What opened up then was uh, I did a little outlaw show out in Laverne, Tennessee, which was a lot of fun some nights. One night I was in there, they had three people in the crowd. Damn. I walk out with the microphone, I'm like, welcome to the show. I'm like, what? Three people. <laughs> I turn off the microphone, I go over and stand by them. We're like, well, you guys are in for a really great show tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it's all going to happen right over in your vicinity. So you, right. you guys got it good. Hey, why don't you sit up here in the front? You know, no problem. But uh did that for a while. But then I got a call from my friend Jason James, who was working for the National Wrestling Alliance affiliate here in Nashville. It was called NWA Main Event, and it was run by a guy named Mike Porter. And I didn't really know Mike Porter, but I came in, and he said, well, come in and do some ring announcing for us. And I said, okay. You know? And so then I came in, and I ring announced for them for a long time. Uh, got to meet Bill Barons there. <clears throat> That guy had a huge, huge part in developing me because then I went from just ring announcer to, I mean, I shadowed that guy because he wrote those shows and he wrote them so good and he knew how to, how to get reactions out of the crowd in just the right times where he wanted it, how to surprise them, how to give them what they wanted, how to make them mad about not getting what they wanted. And he was just such an awesome writer when it came to pro wrestling up to that point. He was the best one I'd ever been around, so I'd shadow him everywhere. So they're doing a TV taping over there, and they bring me in a guy called, they call him the Wicked, Wicked Nemesis, and he's uh -huh. going to be my commentary partner, and he's awesome. But I don't even know this guy from nothing. So Bill Barons takes us in and sits us down. He goes, I want you to cut the show open. He goes, I got the camera. This is, these are the notes, the points I need you to hit, you know, and then let's take it to the ring. And for not knowing any of these guys ever, we nailed it in one take. And we were consistently nailing those things in one takes. And then we'd go out to the ring and call the matches and, you know, be able to sit and talk to Bill Barron and be like, okay, so if we talk about this, why is this happening? You know, and then you'd explain it all. And you're like, oh, that makes so much sense. And I love being around him, but he was from all the way down in Georgia in a town called uh -huh. Cornelia. And it was a long haul for them guys to come he up. He was running um, wild side at the time. That's right. right. Yep. yep. 100%. That's guys, AJ Styles come from there. You know, a lot of, a uh, lot of guys. Our truth. From there. Yeah. Our truth know? was from there. Uh, Jimmy rave, I believe was yep. from there. Uh, totally. There was a lot of guys from there. A lot of guys that went on to say, you know, WWF or WWE, excuse me, or ring of honor, etc. Yeah, TNA, 100%. For, you know, I think, um, <clears throat> excuse me. TNA used them as a developmental for a while too, I think. Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, that would make sense yeah. because, you know, you talk, talk about Jimmy Rabe, you talk about AJ Styles, guys like that. They totally yep. 
graduated to TNA, you know? Yeah. And Baron and, is on their TV as the president, you know, as the president uh, and Slim right. J. Thank you very much. Andy yep, Mick, that's Slim right. J was on there. Yep. Oh, I got to turn the comments on. I always forget to yeah. do that. Yeah. Yep. But, uh, so, I mean, that's Bill Barron's. If you can spend any amount of time with that guy, it can only help your career. You know, he's going right. to make you wise to things you never even thought about before. So then eventually the Bill Barron's era, Air Paris, that was another good yep. one. Yep. Yep. He, uh, the Bill Barron's era kind of, you know, ends up going away at main event. And then it's just back to just, it, it felt like just dropping off. It felt like, you know, filming Monday Night Raw to only work in house shows. Cause I'd show up then and it would be one of the workers would be booking the show. And he'd be like, all right, well, what did we do last week? Oh, yeah, well, tonight it's going to be you and you, uh, you two against you two. We're we'll going to intermission. We're going to do the match with these two guys. And then me and my buddies over here, we're going to be main event, you know, and we're going to really rock the place tonight <laughs> and have no care about nothing else about the show. And it's yeah, like, yeah. man, to go from working with Bill Barron's to that, it really sucked. It really yeah. sucked. You know, something you could look past before after going through that experience with Bill you just couldn't overlook it, you know? So I'd go to Mike Porter and I'd say, man, this sucks. You know, you know, it sucks. Look at the crowd. You know, it's, it's dwindling. Let me do it. And he'd be like, you don't have any experience writing a show. I said, I don't care. I know I can do a better job than this, you know, and I'm not mm. one of the boys. So I don't, I'm not looking out for friends. I'm looking out for you. I'm looking out for this show. I'm looking out for the fans and trying to bring in as many as we can. And I will, I will write some awesome shows. And I said, you know, you bring in whoever you want, you know, I'll play with the toys you give me, you know? So I never, right. I could never say I was a booker because I never handed a single person an envelope, but, or got to really say, I'm bringing this guy in. I could go to Porter and say, Hey, what do you think about this guy? And sometimes he'd be like, eh, I'll think about it. And other times he'd be like, uh-uh, and don't ever bring up his name in my presence again. You know, like, oh, shit, okay, okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry. But I was given the pieces and then had to make it something, and right. we did. You know, the crew of guys that I had at that time, guys like Drew Haskins, guys like uh, Jason Nesmith, um, uh, Stephen Green, uh, Dyron Flynn. I mean, there were so many good guys at that time. Um, Kevin Weatherby was a part of that. I mean, I, the list could go on and on seven, man. One of my favorite people to work with Jimmy street, the team that I had surrounded myself with, or was lucky enough to be surrounded by were so good, you know, and there was really good ones. And there was ones that weren't so good, but I'd find a right. way to work them all in. Like we had this team, they were called the family and they were not, really great professional wrestlers but the people loved them you know yeah. they never won you know they didn't win a single match <laughs> but the people loved them so that was their place and they understood it where other guys are involved in these you know back and forth crazy things these guys always lose and i tell them you know don't feel bad about losing because someday someday you're gonna win and it's going to blow the roof off this freaking place. And I saved it forever. And actually, the way it worked out, I don't think they ever got their win. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. I'm doing that for a while. And that's amazing, you know, to be able to, because what we would do is we, I said, let's do it like a real wrestling promotion formula where we're working towards a big show, you know, where we're building up to this. So then I'd open my notebook like four pages down the line and go, okay, this is going to be our big show this month. These are the matches I want to do. How do we get there? You know, and then flip backwards from there and fill in all the blanks. And so then everything had a good story arc to it leading to the big conflict at the end. You know, same formula, WCW, AWA, WWE, WWF have done it for years. You know, it's, it's simple. And, you know, cut promos and do all the things I know are going to work, you know, and should work if you care enough to take the time to really try to do it. And you got a good crew around you that's willing to work with you. Because I tell you, when it comes to workers, if they're getting paid halfway decent and you're giving them something good to work with, something they really sink their teeth into, they're going to show up. 
You know, I always hear promoters go, you know, yeah, you try to build storylines, but then, you know, guys don't show up. Man, I hardly never, ever had anybody not show up that was working through one of the storylines we were laying out because everybody was so excited about it because there's twists and turns and surprises. And sometimes some of the younger guys would come to me and go like, so you want me to say this tonight? I said, you know, do your own thing, but just make sure you slip this line in there. I need you to at least mention it. Go, but what does it mean? That doesn't make any sense. And I'd be like, trust me, you know, I need you to do it. But with some of them young guys, you wouldn't want to lay out the whole thing to them because they go back, tell their little girlfriend in the crowd. And then, you know, next thing you know, everybody knows what's going to happen. Like the older, the guys that had been there for a minute that I could trust, I could lay it all out to them. Some of them guys, you have to be like, you're just going to have to trust me, you know, and, and make sure you say it. And then even those guys like two weeks later would come back and be like, so that's why I said that two weeks ago. Oh my God, that makes so much sense. So if it worked on you, I know the crowd is going to go nuts right. when it plays out. So nobody knows. None of the fans know I'm right in the show. I'm just the general manager sort of guy. And I don't do a whole lot, but help tie the stories together. And so I could like, when I knew those moments were about to happen, I could go out to the crowd, sit back and watch got them again hell yeah you know they love it or they hate it they're gonna come back next week and hopefully see this guy get killed or whatever you know but i right. took it so serious the writing you know i wanted to cover every detail because back then there was a little kind of a podcast that was sort of local and they would come to the shows and they'd pick your ass apart if you were if you were leaving plot holes and things that didn't make sense you know so you really had to you really had to make sure everything was was check marked off that you had it all covered. Right. And we did it, man. And we would pack that place every Thursday night. People would come back and come back. And I'd always leave them with the hook, you know. Holy shit, what's gonna happen next week? We gotta come back and find out. And we did so good for so long. And then, you know, in the wrestling business, there's always pol there's always politics. You can't seem to ever escape them you know, in one form or another, some worse than others. But there was a guy in there that was my buddy. I thought he was my buddy. He said he was my buddy. And what I would do is to time the matches, I would have him sit out kind of in the crowd to the edge and he would give signals to the referee. If they're dying, if it ain't happening, cut it. You know, if they're on fire, let it roll a little bit. And so this guy got a customer hanging out around there and was kind of politicking behind my back, but I seen it coming. I really seen it coming. And this, this speaks to my dedication to the never leave a stone unturned or never let a storyline die without completion in a very, very rare piece of wrestling history. I wrote myself out of NWA main event. <laughs> Isn't he that that's available to places, right? Like YouTube. You can there's find those YouTube. episodes. Yeah, there's some yeah. stuff out there on YouTube, but this one was uh it came down to I had seven there was like this Weasley villain, Weasley heel guy, not real tough, always cheat, always conniving. And so he's messing with me, messing with me as the the vice president. And so I put him in a match with seven. And seven's this big monster, you know, and so seven kills him in the match. So he comes back and he's got damage to his brain because of this match that I put him in. So one week he comes back and he's Hulk Hogan. Hogan's music hits. He comes out, all the stuff, you know, goes out, loses. Next week comes out, he's Ric Flair, you know, some kind of half-ass robe. And right. every week he's something different because he's lost his mind after that match. When it comes down to it, I know what's all going down behind the scenes. I say, okay, so you come to the ring and you're going to reveal to me that you don't have brain damage at all, but you've actually gotten me fired from the NWA main event board of directors or whatever. You hit me in the face. I roll out of the ring. Boom, done. Now at this point, I got two choices. So I'm letting the promoter think that, you know, 
Next week, I'm going to come back and I'm going to be taking tickets or I'm going to be working concessions. Or you're going to see me mop in the bathroom. You know, I've, I've fallen from my perch and eventually I'll find a way to come back or whatever, you know, or, or don't, you know. Right. And but in my heart, I'm going, I know what's going on here. You know, I know uh-huh. this guy is weaseling my spot. I know he's he's probably going to get it. I got some other cool stuff in the works. And so I need to kind of step away from this anyway. And so when I got hit, I rolled out of the ring. I walked out the front door. I got in my car. I never went back. (laughs) Wow. Completion in your storyline. It's so important. Don't let shit just hang loose and be like, why did that guy leave? They never really explained. I hate that stuff. Yeah, yeah, it happens every, you know, it happens weekly, actually, (laughs) you know, a lot of times. At the highest level sometimes. Yeah, it absolutely does. WWE, Uh, it used to drive me crazy. I hated it. So that was my most important thing. You know, reality, excitement, characters, completion. You know, you get, you got to have the build. You got to have the climax. And so I wrote myself out of a wrestling show, which I'm pretty proud of because not a lot of people can say that. No, I'm going to have to look that up, see uh, if any of those episodes are on uh, YouTube. I know I've caught a few of them uh, back in the day, you know, a couple of years back. I'm going to have to look even more. Those so fun times. I miss those. Did, I miss writing them shows. I miss the guys I worked with. Yeah, I've always been a huge NWA fan in many different incarnations throughout the, you know, the 80s, the 90s, yeah. uh, the 2000s. And currently, it's like my favorite yeah. wrestling show I watch, you know. Yeah, right uh, now, it's really cool. I like it. I like yeah. the throwback style of it. Yeah, uh, they're going to be running. <clears throat> excuse me, a show uh, with an with an indie, you know, an affiliated uh, indie up here. In, well, I'm in Connecticut, but in Brooklyn. So, oh, nice. uh, in June. So I'm hoping to take the drive. It's about a two hour drive from here, but uh, it might be worth the drive for that. If I can go to Brooklyn for Survivor Series, I can go up there for that. I guess <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, we so. got Survivor Series coming here to Nashville this year, and. The NWA is putting on a real big show here in Nashville coming up real soon. That's um, in June. I think it's like the night yeah. before the show that they're in Brooklyn, which is the weird part. So, <laughs> so I think they're doing the uh, that Matt Cardona pay-per-view, I think, over there. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Um, so what do you think? What? Where did you go uh, from there, from the NWA? All right. So... This, this was the real writing on the wall for me here was, so I'm working for Porter, loving it, you know, and writing the shows and getting such satisfaction on it and feeling like an artist that's creating masterpieces on a weekly, you know, weekly basis with all my awesome friends that are all pitching in on it. And they come to me and they go, I go, Hey, I want to let you know, I'm going to be working this other show for this other promotion on this Saturday night coming up like a month from now. I just want to give you plenty of heads up. We don't run on Saturday nights, so it doesn't interfere with what we're doing here, but they're running a show down at the fairgrounds, you know, the historic fairgrounds where I would go see TNA, where I would see Jeremy Borash, where I would say someday I'm going to, I'm going to work a show here someday. I, I swear I will. I get the call from my friend Marcus and a guy named Hammerjack and they're putting together a show that's going to be tribute to the fairgrounds. Because even way back, this I'm thinking, mm, I don't have the dates in front of me. I like 2009, 10, around in there, okay. maybe. Crossfire Wrestling is what I'm talking about. Okay. And they uh, were doing the tribute to the fairgrounds show first. And they, I was the first guy they contacted. And they said, you know, you're the guy. You got to host the show. You got to ring it out. It's all that do interviews, whatever. I said, cool, man, I'm in, you know, I just, I want to work at the fairgrounds. So at the time, I think I was thinking it was like a one-time deal and they said, well, maybe it could turn into more. Mm -hmm. And man, we did that show at the fairgrounds and it felt like TNA. It felt like the asylum days because there were a lot of people there for it and they had some big stars and it was great. And then they did tribute to the fairgrounds too. And then eventually these shows turn into crossfire wrestling. And now I'm working with guys like Matt Hardy, you know, sitting backstage and listening to him talk about wrestling and how he's laying stuff out. And he is that Matt Hardy's a smart dude. You know, Mm -hmm. he could run a promotion. If I was going to have somebody writing my show for me, I'd probably want Matt Hardy doing it based on all the stuff that I've done over the years, times where they're doing promos in the back room. You got Shane Douglas in there with Jerry Lynn. 
Incredible and, guy, Shane Douglas. Yeah. And they got He's, Paul Burchill cutting oh, a wow. promo. Yep. And yep. I'm in the room and I'm standing back. I'm on the wall. I'm not saying a word. You know, I'm silent, but I'm watching all this, soaking it in, and I'm loving it. And he's like, he cut his promo, and he'd be like, what'd you think of that? You know, that was okay, huh? And they go, yeah, it was all right. He goes, I think I could do it better. You know, they say, well, how about this? You know, or maybe add add this to it or, you know, do this with you, you know, when you do it. And I'm like, man, these guys are so damn smart. You know, they, they are brilliant. You know, I'm watching artists at work here. And, you know, Jerry Lynn and Shane Douglas, they, you know, they, they've been great for a long, long time, each of uh-huh. them. So they're in there helping some of these younger guys. And it's stuff like that I'm getting to see. And being in the ring with Rowdy Roddy Piper, you know, and introducing him to do a Piper's Pit. Crossfire Wrestling always had a section for Make-A-Wish, Make-A-Wish in Middle Tennessee kids. And uh, that was always pretty wild because, like, I would take the ring bell and I'd go sit in the crowd with them little kids and I'd let them ring the bell, you know, to start the match, to end the match. Um, I remember seeing Brett the Hitman Hart one time before the show. There's no reporters or nothing around. He's leaned up on the railing. He's talking to all them little kids. You know, I'm like, this mm-hmm. is amazing. Um, Roddy Piper at that time had survived cancer. So I get to introduce him for a Piper's pit. And he comes out in his Piper's pit is talking to these little kids about, you know, hey, they told me I wasn't going to make it. They told me I had no chance. He goes, but I didn't give up. I fought, you know, and it was this totally inspirational thing, you know, to be able to be a part of something like that was amazing and you know that i'm i'm in the ring with mick foley you know and and i mean i'm in the ring for uh for jerry lynn's very last match ever in nashville tennessee and you know it just in the ring with heroes you know getting to hang out with the masterpiece and kid cash you know like they're just pals you know but they're such awesome integral parts of what was going on there and those fairground shows i mean the one with bret hart on it they packed 5,000 people into that building. It was out of this world. I've got a photo that my wife took, and she's up in the balcony taking a picture of me, teeny tiny down in the <laughs> ring by myself with this massive crowd around me, and I'm going to get that thing blown up because I love it. That's incredible to think about, that they yeah, it's, it's 5,000 people there. Yeah, and non- all there for wrestling, yeah. you know, and yeah. I've – I got him in the palm of my hand, you know, we're having a good time and everybody's loving it. So it was, it was a thrill, you know, and it was, it was awesome, you know, and I'm always grateful to Marcus for giving me the opportunity to fulfill the goal that I'd set for myself when I first came to Nashville and first saw the TNA shows down at the fairgrounds. Like I'm going to do that someday. I'm going to be in that ring in this building and it's going to be packed out and I could see it in my mind. And then eventually, you know, those days would come. And that was another one, man. That was Crossfire, man. They were so good and we're filming everything and I'm doing interviews. Uh, one of my favorite things I ever got to do was a backstage a backstage segment between uh, Chris Adonis, which people knew him as the masterpiece, yep. and Jimmy Vegas. And that's on there. I think it's like Jimmy Vegas tells Chris Masters to eat potatoes or something is the title of the video. But it's one of my favorite things, you know, that I, I get to see. Like, I didn't know about that. And one day somebody sent it to me. I was like, holy shit, I remember this stuff. So I'm doing all kinds of stuff for them. And the whole purpose of Crossfire became we're shooting pilots for a TV show. You know, there was like some storylines that continued. They introduced a champion, uh, had a tournament for the championship. Matt Hardy's there. Um Uh, Shane Helms came in. They had a little bit of a story going on, packing the fairgrounds every couple of months, doing these crossfire shows. And then they come around and they say to me, Aaron Camaro, we're taking this to the next level. Like, oh, no. I want that haircut. (laughs) No. (laughs) No? Don't take it to the next level. No, they love me there. Oh, all right. But it was shortly thereafter that the promotion crumbled and went away. That's a shame. So it's the death knell. If you're in professional wrestling and somebody says, hey, buddy, we're taking this to the next level, watch out. <laughs> Some people just should stay where they are. If they're doing yeah, well, you know, yeah. it's that next level that could ultimately kill them. But it's way. really sad because at that time, they're like that was kind of a lull there. Like now you mm-hmm. say you can turn on TV any night of the week and catch wrestling or catch a live stream, whatever. Yeah. Back then, I mean – 
NWA wasn't doing what it's doing now. There yeah. was no it was such thing as AEW. The yeah. There yeah. was, I mean, no MLW. Yeah. Um, there was WWE. There was TNA and Japan. And- yeah, that and was Ring it of for Honor. American wrestling. Yeah. And yeah. Ring of Honor. And that was really about it at that time. So mm-hmm. we were trying to get on with a network called Ion. And it okay. was something I'd never heard of before up to that point. But I was at that point, I was like, I don't care. Get us on TV. I think Impact ended up on Ion for a little bit. It's one of those weird channels that you, you have to have like direct TV or something. Right. And it's yeah. way down the list, you know. Yep. But we were so excited for it. We had contracts like, here you go. This is what your contract's going to look like. And when the time comes, then we will present you with the actual contract and you sign it then. But we want to give it to you ahead of time so you know what to expect. So if it's going right. to work for you or not. So, I mean, we got to that point where we we're so close. And then whew, it's gone, gone. Yeah, Still breaks my heart. It, it happens a lot in professional wrestling. Yeah. You know, it's not easy, least, man. No. It is not easy to do it. If you're, if you think, you know, hey, I think I'm going to start a pro wrestling company, you better have a lot of money to throw away mm-hmm. to say goodbye to because you're going to lose it before you ever really get something going because it takes time and it takes the right people. And one little thing out of place can topple the whole thing. You know, it's really. There's nothing like pro wrestling as far as an industry goes. You take out the entertainment side of it. You look at it as an industry. There's nothing else out there like it. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing runs the way a professional wrestling company does. It's, it's so weird and foreign, but yet that's kind of what makes it exciting to work in the pro wrestling business is the unpredictability of it. The, you know, the fact that it takes special people to really be able to do it, you know, whether it's, entertainer in the ring a ring announcer a cameraman you know right in the show whatever you know it takes very unique people unique minded people to even survive it you know because it's such a a strange atmosphere sometimes but i mean if you can do it god bless you because it ain't easy earlier you mentioned uh jerry jarrett now uh you did work with him correct uh, Jerry Jarrett over yeah. uh, over the years, I've worked several shows with him. A lot of them where he's making appearances. I got to okay. the best time I ever spent with Jerry Jarrett was he was doing a seminar okay. at the NWA main event building, and I was like, "You need help? I'll volunteer." You know, you need somebody to hold the microphone while these guys you're teaching them how to cut promos properly. I'll do that. You know, I'll totally be here. So I took a Saturday and spent it hanging out with Jerry Jarrett. And, you know, he was a guy that always, he made me feel appreciated all the time. He really liked what I could do. Like that day, like he's trying to get dude to cut the promo and it's just not working out. And so I'm like feeding them lines, you know, as, as the interviewer. So it'd be like, uh, so, you know, so-and-so said this about your woman. That must make you really mad, huh? And I'd put the microphone from him. He'd like, <laughs> yep real mad and i go wow man you know that must make you really want to do something to him this saturday night huh you're gonna tear him up good aren't you you're gonna really kick his ass ain't you and you're like you bet i am <laughs> <laughs> some people so don't i'm get actually it. cutting yeah. the promo and he's just kind of yeah. you bet i am <laughs> <laughs> so what was jerry like uh you know work to work with those few times that you got came across him Super nice guy. Yeah, super nice guy. Jerry Jarrett was always super nice to me. Um, Never wanted me to get my hair cut. Liked me the way I was. Um, But yeah, the main thing would have been that day at that promo class thing that he did was the best real time I spent with him. Otherwise, you know, I've been at shows where he's signing autographs and stuff. And I don't want to bug nobody when they're over there signing autographs and meeting their fans and stuff. So, you know never got to work with him like as my boss or anything like that, Mm -hmm. which would have been cool, you know, but I was, you know, I was a child out of time down here. If I'd have been down here in the eighties and the seventies, I'd be in the WWE hall of fame by now. I got to (laughs) think because I'd have been all in back then. So you don't mind me asking. I do know that you, uh, you did work with (laughs) Dale Gagne's version of the AWA. Well, I need to ask you about this at least. Uh, you know, I find it interesting that he decided a couple of years after Vern closed the doors to just uh, take it upon himself to start it and it restarted rather. And he ran that thing for a couple of years. Yeah. You know, for quite a while, actually. 
Yeah, he sure did. Um, when I when my path crossed with him was because I was working at the radio <laughs> station and I was still pretty young into it. But I had first gotten my own like night shift show. Uh -huh. And so I'm I'm really all in on that. And they're doing a wrestling show. It's an AWA wrestling show in Wassa. I can't remember where the what the venue was, but it's uh it's an AWA. And so they come to me and they go, Hey, we got these wrestling tickets to give away. And I go, Oh, awesome. You know, I can I can come up with like wrestling trivia questions to ask to give them away. And they give me all the tickets. And I go, well, doesn't anybody else want none to give away? And they're like, nobody else cares about wrestling. I go, okay, I'll give them all away. <laughs> so I'm a wrestling fan, so I'm having a blast coming up. And this is before I do anything in the business. I'm having a blast coming up with trivia questions. So then they go, well, I mean, you're getting a pretty good response on this. Do you want to interview the guy putting on the show? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do. And so they're like, okay, it's just Dale Gagne. I don't know nothing. You know, this is really kind of before the internet really takes off. So I'm not really keeping up on like the, what's, what's cool, the AWA like, anymore, you know? He rang and announced so, for, uh, for Vern towards the end. He yeah. wasn't ring announcer for a while. And he okay. used the name Dale Gagne, but they never, I don't think he was actually any relation. I think his last name no. is something different. Yeah. It's yeah. Cause it's like I asked him, yeah. I asked him about that, you know, because I'm naive. I don't know no better not to ask. So <laughs> I say, you know, so you're Dale Gagne, you know, AWA infamous around here, you know, watched it for years, you know, back in the, to the seventies, people loved AWA around here. So, I mean, is this the AWA? Is it back? Are you related to Vern Gagne? And he's like, well, no, I mean, not really. He kind of danced around it a little bit, you know. Right, I was like, okay, right. well, whatever, you know. Honky Tonk Man's going to be there. Everybody get your tickets. You know, I got a pair of tickets to give away right now. You know, who defeated, ended the Honky Tonk Man streak, you know. And they're like, somebody calls the Ultimate Warrior. Two tickets. So the day of the show comes. Remember, I'm a wrestling, I'm a wrestling idiot. I'm a nerd, you know. I, <laughs> I, I just, I'm crazy and I can't not. I want to know everything about it. And I'm working at the radio station. I get the passes, go to this show. Nobody wants to go with me. So I end up going by myself. So I'm there. And the first person I see is Dale Gagne. He says, come on in, you know, whatever you need, talk to whoever you want, you know, grab a seat. Your seat can be over here. He was very accommodating. And uh, I mean, cause he actually had a radio station DJ that really gave a shit about the wrestling show coming to town. So he was real cool to me. First, excuse me, first person I meet, the honky tonk man. So I got to go say hi to him, you know. So I talk to him a little bit, you know, and talk to him about his career and talking about certain matches. And he's kind of looking at me like, okay, this guy kind of knows what he's talking about. So then when we're done talking, I got a little, one of those little WrestleMania trading cards with him on it. And I go, would you sign my card? You know, and he goes, hmm. So how much do you suppose that card becomes worth once I sign it? <laughs> and again, I'm I'm pretty young and naive, and I go, I, I mean, I don't know. I I just I just want it for me. And he's like, okay, you know. And so he signs yeah, it for yeah, me. Yeah. He goes, he goes, well, what do you want me to sign it as? I was like, um, honky tonk man, <laughs> <laughs> right? He goes, okay, right, honky tonk man on the card gives it to me. Next person I meet is the Patriot. I'm looking Del at Wilt. the Patriot, and I'm going, hmm. Something's not right about this guy. You know, something's not right about this guy. He's not the Patriot I, that I know. You know, this is somebody uh, different. And so I'm looking at him. I'm looking at him. And I'm talking. I get talking to him. He go, you know, I go, so you're the Patriot, huh? And he just kind of looks at me. He goes, yeah. I said, uh, but you're not the real Patriot. <laughs> and he goes, well, what do you mean? And so I tell him, you know, well, you know, the Patriot is Del Wilk and he's had been the Patriot for years. And I mean, he's wearing a mask, but I can see you're not Del Wilk. And he goes, all right, let me tell you something. So it turns out it's Tom Brandy. Right. So Tom Brandy's telling, he goes, I'm actually Tom Brandy. I go, okay, cool. You know, I know you. And he goes, uh, man, you really know your stuff. And I felt so proud. Like my heart just swelled because like somebody actually complimented me on my useless professional wrestling knowledge for like the <laughs> first time in my life. I felt acknowledged in all the hours I'd spent 
researching, you know, and all this. And so he's like, well, you really know your stuff. He goes, well, here's the deal. You know, Del Wilk, Wilkes retired and I bought the gimmick off him. And I thought, wow, I didn't know you could do that, but that makes total sense. He goes, so now I'm going to come out. I'm going to wrestle as Tom Brady. I'm going to lose. I'm going to go to the back. I'm going to put on the Patriot stuff. I'm going to come back out. I'm going to win. Get paid twice. I was like, oh, yeah, that's <laughs> smart, dude. That's smart, you know? And uh, the only other thing I really remember about that night is uh, uh, Scrap Iron Adam Pierce. All right. Wrestled, um, oh, what was his name? Adrian. Oh, man, I hate myself for not thinking of it. But he was a, a guy that wrestled in Wisconsin all the time, too. But, mm-hmm. yeah, Adam Pierce wrestled on that show. And at the time, yeah. I was like, I didn't know who he was. But I thought, well, this guy's pretty good. You know, I like him. I'll have to look up that more must about have been Adam pretty Pierce. Young. Right. Uh, at the yeah, time, he was, yeah, yeah, he was a young kid. You well, know, I don't know about kid, yeah. but well, no, maybe yeah. about my age, I guess. Future NWA champion yeah. at that time. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Got it's a funny that on Raw. Raw now. yeah, now he's on Raw just about uh, every week now. Yeah, man, nothing makes me happier than seeing people I know on the major TV shows. Like, and to yeah. me, it's always referees. It's every time I see uh, they, they well, Rudy Charles to me. Dan mm-hmm. Engler in the WWE. I mean, he's wrestled some of the top matches ever, WrestleMania matches and stuff, but that was my buddy. You know, we used to, I used to always work wrestling shows with him here in Nashville, and we'd have so much fun hanging out together. And then he went on, and I'm always so happy and proud to see him. When I see Mike Posey refing oh, matches wow. for AEW and stuff, it makes me smile because, I mean, these are guys that I know I used to pal around with all the time, you know. I, I see guys like uh, Cedric Alexander. I walked into one of these outlaw wrestling shows one night to make a few extra bucks and have some fun. And Cedric Alexander, what the hell are you doing here? And he's like, well, just passing through. So I took the booking. I was like, wow, okay. You're like, you're way out of place here, but, you know, careful out there. Have fun. (laughs) It's funny you said that. Now it's like same thing happens around here. Yeah. It's, you know, one day, you remember when, WWE had that TV show, 205 Live, right? Yep. It was on the uh, network. So one yep. day, <clears throat> probably a week prior, I was Chris Bay made an appearance on there, right? Mm-hmm. Next week, he's at a local indie. And then all of a sudden, I'm, I sit there. I was like, hey, man, I saw your match on, you know, his tryout match, basically. And I was like, hey, it's like you did real good. He goes, oh, that's great. But my tryout uh, for Impact is actually Aaron tonight. So that's where he ended up signing. So it was right. kind of cool. He just like in the room literally fits less than 70 people, maybe 50 right. people. So, you know, it was real cool that he came through town, uh, a room that small, you know. They used to run shows here. Uh, Tony Falk ran shows here. It was called USWO. And I remember they ran, that. Yeah. They ran at the Stadium Inn. Yeah. Which was uh, the craziest place to have wrestling because it was. I mean, anybody that's here ain't going to fault me for saying it. It was a kind of a crack hotel. <laughs> and, you know, it wouldn't be surprising to see hookers out in the parking lot and stuff, you know. And so you'd walk into this place, and it's this dirty, run-down old hotel, and you'd go down into the basement, and that's where the wrestling show was yeah. at. So at first, like, we'd go down there as fans. They had a bar set up in there, so you'd be like – you're playing this old country music and these old people sitting at the bar, but then in the next room, there's a wrestling show going on. But the ceiling is so short, you know, not tall in there. They gotta they gotta cut the knees, cut the ring off at the knees. So it's like right. a half of a foot step to get into the ring. And we'd see uh uh Chuck Taylor had a run mm-hmm. down there where he was there all the time. And so it's kind of cool to know that you know, you see these guys on TV. You think they're big stars. Well, I mean, they wrestle at places like the stadium in too, you know, to right. and, and wrestle shows in front of five people, I'm sure, you know, and, and there's any way you're going to make it there. Odds are, if you're taking the route that most people take, you're going to have nights like that. Like it always makes me smile on my way into town. I drive Dickerson road sometimes and I drive past the Congress Inn. The Congress Inn is famous from Stone Cold Steve Austin's book where he talked about when he worked for Jerry Jarrett here in Nashville, wasn't making no money. He'd be at the Congress Inn because it was the cheapest hotel eating raw potatoes to survive (laughs) just to be able to be a part of the business. And it's cool to drive past that place and go, 
yeah, there's Steve Austin's old place. He'd be in there eating raw potatoes, you know, trying to make a living to make it in the wrestling business. The building still stands and he surpassed everything that he ever thought he could ever dream to do while he's sitting in this dumpy old hotel right here. So I love stuff like that. And, you know, he just worked a match, his first match in, what, 19 years? Yeah. Probably one of the best matches of the night, <laughs> believe it or yeah. not. You know, most I exciting was, anyway, you know, maybe not yeah. the most proficient, but it was probably the most exciting. Yeah. Well, I was actually surprised that he actually was able to, to pull the whole thing off, you know, yeah. and that uh, knowing the injuries that he had to his neck and knees, et cetera, he actually took some good bumps. Yeah, you know, he did. And it, it was It was pretty surprising. It was pretty cool, man. I love Stone Cold yeah. Steve Austin. Yeah. I love it. Back in the I, day, like he came out of nowhere and was yeah. became like the biggest sensation in professional wrestling just based on being a total badass, you know, and not mm-hmm. taking shit off of nobody. And, you know, the intermingling in with Vince McMahon on it, it was mm-hmm. perfect. You know, it was yeah, you had to have something damn good to stand up to the NWO and what they were doing on Nitro. And they found it with Stone Cold. After everybody else wrote him off, you know, it's amazing. I remember seeing him in, uh, you know, USWA when he made his mm-hmm. debut. Those those couple weeks where he was Steve Williams with the blonde hair and those ridiculous looking tights, you know, before yeah. he was uh, Steve Austin and, and feuding with uh, gentleman Chris Adams and stuff, yeah. you know. So, yeah, the guy went uh, a long way and he became the biggest star in professional wrestling. For sure. And it's cool to know that, you know, from humble beginnings, you know, and it just shows when you're, yeah. when you got something you believe in and you want it so bad, you know, you, you got to tough it out. You can't just walk out and go, you know what? These guys made me wait 40 minutes. I ain't waiting around no more. I'm out of here. You yeah. know, I could have got my car and left that night and never did anything. <laughs> I said, yeah. no, I'm going to turn around and go back in because this is important and I got to do it. You know, I said someday I'd be in that ring at the fairgrounds and I'm, you know, you, this is the way to do it, I guess. That's right. Um, so do you have anything else you want to throw out there before we wrap um, it up? Well, I got a wrestling show coming up on uh, May 21st. If you're in the Nashville area, it's in Ashland City. It's for CHW. Uh, my good friend Mike Green runs that, and he's a good guy. And he's been putting on some really good shows out there. They got some big surprises coming up. I'm having a lot of fun right now. Cause I'm, I come back, I haven't done any wrestling shows in, in quite a while. And i had been doing stuff down in Lewisburg with my friends, Mikey Dunn and Lawrence, the sharp dressed man. And have, I always have a blast down there. But so recently I hadn't done nothing for since new year's Eve on 2019, I made my in-ring debut and we lost and then the pandemic hit. And then it was, you know, I, I feel somehow responsible. So it's it's been two years since I've done anything, and so I come right. back, and it's like these young kids, and I go out and do what I do, you know. And I mm-hmm. know that not all independent wrestlers do it like I do it, you know. I really try to. My job is I get over by getting them over before they even get to the ring, and if I can do that, then I'm doing something good. And it's fun to see these young kids be like, nobody's ever announced me like that before. And I'm like, well, man, that's that's what I do, you know. And they go, you're so good at this. Have you been doing it for a while? Yeah, yeah, I've been I've been doing it for a while, you know. And I had a laugh because uh, this one guy, two brothers, and one's like, man, you're you're really good at this, you know. And the brother Elvis was like, don't you know who that is? That's Aaron Camaro, you know. He's he's been doing this for like 15 years. He's been in the ring with Bret Hart. He's been in the ring with Roddy Piper. You know, he's announced all these mega star guys, and it makes me feel good because it's like, wow, I'm a veteran now. You know, these young kids want right. to sit around and hear my stories, you know, and the things that I've seen and done. And it's kind of a trip to come out on the other side of that as you know, uh, elder statesman of the scene now where these young kids kind of look at you like, wow, you know, it's Aaron Camaro. I can't believe it. I seen him at the fairgrounds when I was 10 years old. <laughs> no, it's, it's kind of awesome to think about, you know, cause yeah. at one time you were on the other side, you know what I mean? As a fan. Well, I'll, I'll leave you with one of my favorite wrestling stories Absolutely. and it comes and it comes full circle because recently I worked a show with a young man that I remembered from a long time ago. So one night I'm at NWA main event and everything's laid out. We're good to go. The show's getting ready to start. We've got a little time. People are still coming in. I'm back at the uh, 
the bell ringers table where they're playing the music and stuff. And I'm talking to them and this little kid comes up to me and he kind of tugs on my arm a little bit and goes, Mr. Camaro, can I ask you a question? And I say, sure, kid, what's up? You know, ask me anything. And he goes, well, when I'm sitting at ringside, I see the wrestlers and they're talking to each other. <laughs> and then my brain goes, oh, shit. Oh, no. You know, don't ask me this. <laughs> so I grab the kid and I shuffle him off to the side by ourselves. And I say, listen, I'm going to tell you something. And I'm going to let you in on the biggest secret in professional wrestling. But you can't tell anybody. You can't tell your friends. You can't tell your parents. And you certainly can't tell anybody that I told you this. I go, promise me. He goes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I promise. I'll never tell. I'll never tell. I go, all right. This is it. The biggest secret in professional wrestling. If you want to be a professional wrestler, one of the most important things you can do is mind games. When they're locking up together, you got to get in there right next to his ear and you got to say the meanest, nastiest things you can think of to throw him off his game. And I said, every great professional wrestler knows it and every great professional wrestler does it. And he gets this big old smile on his face. He goes, thank you, Mr. Camaro. That makes so much sense. Thank you so much. And he ran back to his seat and enjoyed the shit out of the show. And today, that kid is a professional wrestler That's and it awesome. really it gave me a thrill to see him at the show actually working a couple of weeks ago and you know what that kid is over man they call him austin hall he's a okay. little underdog guy and he is over as hell because he knows how to get in there and say the meanest nastiest things to his <laughs> <laughs> but it's true it's cool he grew up and he's he's a wrestler now i love that that's awesome. That's awesome. I told that story in the locker room that night. And as I'm getting to the end of the story that reveals it all, those guys, the workers, they're looking at me like they're going to fucking kill me because they think I'm about to reveal <laughs> something to a kid. And I was like, no, I would never do that. You know, right. yeah. <laughs> that's fucking, that's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Camaro, I want to thank you for joining PWZ tonight. This was a blast. Yeah, uh, it really was, man. We had some great stories. I was a little nervous. I'm not going to lie. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's uh it's awesome. Hakim, hello. Thank you very much for tuning in. We're about to get out of here though. Um I got so, a million stories, man. If you ever want to have me back on, I'm always down to talk oh, yeah. professional wrestling. To the listeners out there, if you're fans of rock music, you know, I found in my lifetime that 98% of pro wrestling fans also love the band Kiss. Why? Because they're both <laughs> over the top, awesome, and entertaining. Right. You know, if if you love wrestling, you probably love Kiss. I love Kiss. Kiss is my favorite band and have been since I was a little kid. We talk a lot about Kiss on the show, but we also talk about all the other good stuff, too. And we're going to teach you that even though the Headbangers Ball is gone, even though you can't go to the store and buy a Hit Parade or a Metal Edge anymore, don't worry because you've got the Decibel Geek podcast. And we're going to keep you up to date on all the latest happenings in the world of rock music, all the newest, latest, great bands. I'm not talking about Machine Gun Kelly and crap like they try to tell you is the future of <laughs> rock and roll. I'm talking about real bands that have the spirit of bands like GNR and Metallica and Kiss and Ozzy and Dio and all that good stuff. So if you're a fan of rock music, check out myself, my awesome co-host, Chris Sinzak, my best buddy. We do the most kick-ass rock show that you've ever heard in your life. It's a podcast. Wherever they're available, you'll find it. I want to thank Buddy Baker for telling me to come on the show, man, because it's been a blast, man. I had fun. Yeah, me too, man. Uh, I definitely, definitely want to do it again. So cool. thank you again. And everybody at uh, tuned in tonight, thank you for tuning in. This will be up uh, everywhere within the hour. Enjoy. Everywhere.